to spend on foreign assistance. But I do not be believe this is charity. For the small fraction of what we spent at war in Iraq, we could support institutions so that fragile states don't collapse in the first place and invest in emerging economies that become markets for our goods. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And that's why we need to follow through on our efforts to combat climate change. If we don't act boldly, the bill that could come due will be mass migrations and cities submerged and nations displaced and food supplies decimated and conflicts born of despair. The Paris Agreement gives us a framework to act, but only if we scale up our ambition. And there must be a sense of urgency about bringing the agreement into force and helping poorer countries leapfrog destructive forms of energy. So for the wealthiest countries, a green climate fund should only be the beginning. We need to invest in research and provide market incentives to develop new technologies and then make these technologies accessible and affordable for poorer countries. And only then can we continue lifting all people up from poverty without condemning our children to a planet beyond their capacity to repair. So we need new models for the global marketplace models that are inclusive and sustainable. And in the same way, we need models of governance that are inclusive and accountable to ordinary people. I recognize not every country in this hall is going to follow the same model of governance. I do not think that America can or should impose our system of government on other countries. But there appears to be a growing contest between authoritarianism and liberalism right now. And I want everybody to understand, I am not neutral in that contest. I believe in a liberal political order, an order built not just through elections and representative government, but also through respect for human rights and civil society and independent judiciaries and the rule of law. I know that some countries which now recognize the power of free markets still reject the model of free societies. And perhaps those of us who have been promoting democracy feel somewhat discouraged since the end of the Cold War, because we've learned that liberal democracy will not just wash across the globe in a single wave. It turns out building accountable institutions is hard work the work of generations. The gains are often fragile. Sometimes we take one step forward and then two steps back. In countries held together by borders drawn by colonial powers, with ethnic enclaves and tribal divisions, politics and elections can sometimes appear to be a zero-sum game. And so given the difficulty in forging true democracy in the face of these pressures, it's no surprise that some argue the future favors the strong man, a top-down model, rather than strong democratic institutions. But I believe this thinking is wrong. I believe the road of true democracy remains the better path. I believe that in the 21st century, economies can only grow to a certain point until they need to open up because entrepreneurs need to access information in order to invent. Young people need a global education in order to thrive. Independent media needs to check the abuses of power. Without this evolution, Ultimately, expectations of people will not be met. Suppression and stagnation will set in. And history shows that strong men are then left with two paths. Permanent crackdown, which sparks strife at home, or scapegoating enemies abroad, which can lead to war. Now, I will admit, my belief that governments serve the individual and not the other way around is shaped by America's story. 
Our nation began with a promise of freedom that applied only to the few, but because of our democratic constitution, because of our Bill of Rights, because of our ideals, ordinary people were able to organize and march and protest, and ultimately those ideals won out. Open doors for women and minorities and workers in ways that made our economy more productive and turned our diversity into a strength. That gave innovators the chance to transform every area of human endeavor. That made it possible for someone like me to be elected President of the United States. So yes, my views are shaped by the specific experiences of America, but I do not think this story is unique to America. Look at the transformation that's taken place in countries as different as Japan and Chile, Indonesia, Botswana. The countries that have succeeded are ones in which people feel they have a stake. In Europe, the progress of those countries and the former Soviet bloc that embraced democracy stand in clear contrast to those that did not. After all, the people of Ukraine did not take to the streets because of some plot imposed from abroad. They took to the streets because their leadership was for sale, and they had no recourse. They demanded change because they saw life get better for people in the Baltics and in Poland, societies that were more liberal and democratic and open than their own. So those of us who believe in democracy, we need to speak out forcefully because both the facts and history, I believe, are on our side. That doesn't mean democracies are without flaws. It does mean that the cure for what ails our democracies is greater engagement by our citizens, not less. Yes, in America, there is too much money in politics, too much entrenched partisanship, too, too little participation by citizens, in part because of a patchwork of laws that makes it harder to vote. In Europe, a well-intentioned Brussels often became too isolated from the normal push and pull of national politics. Too often in capitals, decision makers have forgotten that democracy needs to be driven by civic engagement from the bottom up, not governance by experts from the top down. And so these are real problems. And as leaders of democratic governments make the case for democracy abroad, we better strive harder to set a better example at home. Moreover, every country will organize its government informed by centuries of history and the circumstances of geography and the deeply held beliefs of its people. So I recognize a traditional society may value unity and cohesion more than a diverse country like my own, which was founded upon what at the time was a radical idea, the idea of the liberty of individual human beings, endowed with certain God-given rights. But that does not mean that ordinary people in Asia or Africa or the Middle East somehow prefer arbitrary rule that denies them a voice in the decisions that can save their lives. I believe that spirit is universal. And if any of you doubt the universality of that desire, Listen to the voices of young people everywhere who call out for freedom and dignity and the opportunity to control their own lives. This leads me to the third thing we need to do. We must reject any forms of fundamentalism or racism or a belief in ethnic superiority that makes our traditional identities irreconcilable with modernity. 
Instead, we need to embrace the tolerance that results from respect of all human beings. That's a truism that global integration has led to a collision of cultures. Trade, migration, the Internet, all these things ch can challenge and unsettle our most cherished identities. We see liberal societies express opposition when women choose to cover themselves. We see protests responding to Western newspaper cartoons that caricature the Prophet Muhammad. In a world that, le that left the age of empire behind, we see Russia attempting to recover lost glory through force. Asian powers debate competing claims of history. And in Europe, in the United States, you see people wrestle with concerns about immigration and changing demographics and suggesting that somehow people who look different are corrupting the character of our countries. Now, there's no easy answer for resolving all these social forces. And we must respect the meaning that people draw from their own traditions, from their religion, from their ethnicity from their sense of nationhood. But I do not believe progress is possible if our desire to preserve our identities gives way to an impulse to dehumanize or dominate another group. If our religion leads us to persecute those of another faith, if we jail or beat people who are gay, if our traditions lead us to prevent girls from going to school, if we discriminate on the basis of race or tribe or ethnicity, then the fragile bonds of civilization will fray. The world is too small. We are too packed together for us to be able to resort to the, those old ways of thinking. We see this mindset in too many parts of the Middle East. There, so much of the collapse in order has been fueled because leaders sought legitimacy not because of policies or programs, but by resorting to persecuting political opposition or demonizing other religious sects, by narrowing the public space to the mosque where, in too many places, perversions of a great faith were tolerated. And these forces built up for years and are now at work helping to fuel both serious tragic civil war and the mindless medieval menace of ISIL. The mindset of sectarianism and extremism and bloodletting and retribution that has been taking place will not be quickly reversed. And if we are honest, we understand that no external power is going to be able to force different religious communities or ethnic communities to coexist for long. But I do believe we have to be honest about the nature of these conflicts. And our international community must continue to work with those who seek to build rather than to destroy. And there is a military component to that. It means being united and relentless in destroying networks like ISIL, which show no respect for human life. But it also means that in a place like Syria, where there is no ultimate military victory to be won, we're going to have to pursue the hard work